Hello, hello. Hi. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this year's DevFest. Uh, before we begin, we would really like to say a huge thank you to uh, this year's organizers. It has been a really amazing event so far, and quite a few more interesting talks to come. So, huge thank you. And yeah, let's begin. So, we're going to talk about how to avoid the multi-million user error. Uh, multi-million user error. Uh, we're going to talk about some tips and tricks, do's and don'ts on pretty much the everyday life of almost every software engineer right now. And we're also going to close up with some scary stories, with some uh, ways that me and Federico actually managed to screw up and create some really big problems. And uh, we're going to see what we learned from that and how we managed to overcome all of that. So without further ado, my name is George, and I am a software developer engineer for Amazon, currently working for the Ring team. And I am Federico, uh, also a software development engineer for Amazon on Fire TV. Cool. So <clears throat> by the end of this session, you will be able to review some past examples uh, of uh, bad practices, some mistakes uh, that we've done, and what you could have done to avoid them. You will be able to learn from uh, practically some common situations that we face as developers on our day-to-day -day life. And also, you're going to be able to determine some tiebreaker questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you're going to be able to determine some tiebreaker questions when you're evaluating some uh, questions around yourself and your teams. Before we continue, we want to say that pretty much everything we're going to cover today, it's just our own personal opinions, George's and Federico's, and this is no, in no way, shape, or form connected to Amazon's opinions right now. And let's begin. So I first want you to think and tell me if you've ever been in that sort of situation, if you had these ideas in your head, ideas like how should I go about adding this feature in my code base, whether that is an application, a website, whatever that may be, or should I add something new in my application and that new will break something existing in my code base? Or should I just update everything, all of my libraries, all of my SDKs to the latest versions? Or should I just stay and keep with, uh, with what I know that works and doesn't break anything in my code base? So what we propose is that you should definitely go for it if it makes you feel good. But before you do that, you should first nail three really important steps uh, in pretty much all of software development life cycle. And that is how to write and structure your code, how to properly review each other's code, and then <coughs> how to test and properly release your code into production. Those are three really important steps that you should make sure that are properly covered before you progress with anything else. Uh, so let's begin. All right. So let's start with a fundamental principle of software development, which is separation of concerns and the usage of interfaces to decouple between components. We all know that that is generally a great idea, because by <coughs> adding an interface to decouple between our internal APIs and third-party dependencies, or even in our own code, something that's going to change, it's generally a good idea to just add an interface that very clearly decouples those two parts. And again, it's, it has become something so common. And um, as engineers, we tend to start like, overdoing that. And we fall into this trap of just adding interfaces everywhere and making code that is extremely decoupled. But what we sometimes don't realize is that this really hurts the readability and how to navigate that code especially if you're working on a team that has um, a large number of people integrated into it. Uh, at Amazon, we use a lot of away teaming, which is that another team from another organization comes in and uh, makes some changes in your app. It's much easier to have something that's easier to read, easier to navigate. That's something that is extremely decoupled and uh, very well separated. So as a general rule, something that we have implemented and it worked quite well is if you're going to have only one implementation of an interface, it's probably better to just ditch it. Don't use it. In fact, uh, all IDEs now, IntelliJ, VS Code, Android Studio, 
uh, have macros and shortcuts to just create an interface uh, with two clicks. Next one is on code architecture. And um, this is an interesting one because uh, we've went to so many architectures in the past 10 years. I normally say that um, there's as many architectures as there are software developers in the world because we all have our opinions, we all have our views, and especially with Android, this is a mistake that I made myself. I began by using Model View Presenter, which was the recommended way by, by Google a couple of years ago. This was on my, my first job, by the way. Then I um, learned about MVVM, because Android launched MVVM, and I thought, this is amazing, like, this is really cool. Uh, using observables to communicate, it's much easier to, to test as well. And then I learned about clean architecture. So I thought, this is even cooler. Like, you can make your app super decoupled. Now, this was a project where I was working alone, and um, I was just adding things on top of the other. After a couple of months, uh, two new joiners appear in our team, two junior developers, and I found myself explaining them how our app works, like the business rules that our app solves, how MVP works, how MVVM works, and how clean architecture works, because it was all, all over the code, right? I had implemented that. And it was a huge overload. So what we believe here is just consistency is key uh, when it comes to architecture. Just choose whatever you feel comfortable with and make sure to use it consistently throughout your app. Now, the three things that we normally want to decouple, especially if you're running uh, an Android app or even a, a web app, are view, business, and data fetching. So view in an Android app will be um, your actual views, activities, fragments, composables, anything that contains view code. And you'll normally test that with uh, instrumentation tests and RoboElectric, which are kind of harder to, to understand and to set up and much more slower to run. Business logic on another layer, where you'll have your like, real-world problems that your app is trying to solve. And that should be super easy to test with um, regular mocking libraries, Mockito, Mock uh, JUnit. So they should run really fast. <laughs> and data fetching, we added this because these things change super often. Um, if we're integrating with, a, with an API, uh, if it goes from REST to GraphQL, if it uses XML, these things change really rapidly. And we normally use external dependencies to integrate with this, uh, retrofit, room. And these also change quite rapidly. <coughs> so we think it's normally a good idea to just add a layer to, to separate between our business logic and view logic. A repository pattern is just one example of how you can achieve that. So, as long as you have those three parts separated, don't sweat on it too much on which is the right architecture that you should be using. Next subject is on build speeds. And um, you probably come across this if you're working on Android. Uh, Gradle builds take in a lot. And of course, this impacts the productivity like, massively. Now, our recommendation here is that, in case you didn't know, there's a tool called Build Analyzer, which comes with the Android Studio Gradle plugin. It's a super easy to set up tool that you can run, and it will give you a very detailed set of um, a very detailed set of uh, tasks that are running in your build. So everything that is running with the time that is taking, and um, we implemented this a couple of months ago, and uh, I noticed that our build time was running on around two, two and a half minutes, and uh, by looking at build analyzer, I noticed that there was one static code analyzer that was taking around one and a half minutes, which was massive for a static code analyzer. And again, after diving a, deep, a bit deeper, I noticed that this static code analyzer was only running for Java code, which was only 10%. The rest was in Kotlin. So just by running this analyzer in five minutes, noticing that weird thing and removing it, we were able to optimize our build speed by almost 60, 65%. Cool. So now let's continue talking about something that might seem quite simple and really basic uh, in the face of it. But while you're working uh, on a code base that scales, that gets bigger and bigger, and most importantly, when you're working on a code uh, with, along with other people, along with other teams, uh, it quite quickly gets uh, really important of an issue. And this is how you actually structure your code. Just how you... Uh, where are you putting your classes and what types of folders you're putting, <clears throat> I'm sorry, all of your classes uh, for your code base. We're going to show you uh, the two most well-used uh, uh, types uh, for structuring. 
we're going to tell you some pros and cons, and <coughs> we're going to finish up with what we actually uh, have ended up using in the past. The first one is, <coughs> I'm sorry for that, uh, <coughs> packaging by type. And what do I mean by that? I mean that, let's take an example of an Android application. An Android application can have multiple activities, fragments, exceptions, interfaces, so on, so on. So for each type of all these things, you're having a folder. So you're having a folder for your activities, a folder for all of your fragments, interfaces, exceptions, utilities, and everything else. This might seem quite simple at first, and it definitely helps you when you're trying to find something real quick, especially when you're new to the code base and you're trying to figure something out. You know that you're looking something in your UI, so it's definitely going to be either an activity or a fragment, so you go straight up in there. So there are definitely some uh, really great things about it. But what we figure out that actually uh, does not uh, make it work for us is that it doesn't scale. It does create quite a lot of uh, dependencies and quite a lot of conflicts that need to be resolved when you're working on the same code base uh, alongside multiple developers. And in order to visualize those uh, dependencies, we can, go, we can take a look at the left. At the left, you'll see two boxes, and those boxes practically are the folders, and the blue dots are classes inside the folders or files inside those folders. And all of these lines are dependencies. So all of the files are, of course, dependent on one another. So by packaging our files, our code base by type, you'll see that many files are depending from one box are dependent to many files on the other box. And this is what uh, actually causes uh, quite a lot of conflicts when you're scaling your team. So ideally, what we're trying to do in order to prevent it uh, is we're trying to package everything by feature. And again, it is quite simple once we visualize it. Uh, let's take an example. Let's take an application. Uh, an application can have a sign-in screen and sign-up screen, a forgot password screen, a screen to list all of our products, maybe a screen for somebody to buy some of our products. So instead of just putting all of our activities in one place, we create folders that are separated by the feature or the use case that we want to solve. So we would have a folder for the login. You, you would have a folder for the forgotten password. You would have a folder for the create product uh, use case. And you would put everything that resolves around that use case in that single folder. When you're doing that, of course, it's not always that ideal case that we can see on the left, but we actually reduce the amount of cross package dependencies by quite a lot. Uh, so, and if you actually take uh, another example out of mobile development, if you try, if you think that you have uh, a three, uh, um, you have a massive space and you want to create some offices around it, you wouldn't put all of your desks in one room, all of your chairs in one room, and all of your computers in one room, but you would rather put some desks, some computers, and some chairs in one room some more desks, some more computers, and some more chairs in the other room, and so on, so on. And each room would be there for a single use case. So this is how we are actually uh, implementing uh, this idea, uh, and it has actually helped quite a lot uh, when it comes to merging uh, conflicts in our code base when multiple people are working on it at the same time. Uh, going on? Cool. So the next topic is a quite contentious one, which is on third-party libraries. Uh, so anything that we haven't written ourselves that we want to implement from someone else who did it. And uh, as engineers, again, we normally love to do these things because these are hyped up, everyone is talking about them. But if we're working on a big team with people with different backgrounds, different seniorities, you got to think about the, the fact that not everyone is willing to learn how to use that library. Um, there's super powerful libraries for Android, like uh, Rx, for example, ArcJava, like uh, Coroutines, like Dagger, but they come with a very, very steep learning curve. So if you think about people joining your team, which is something that, again, happens very often for us, uh, you got to think about all the things that they need to learn uh, as they join, plus your architecture, plus the 3P dependencies that you are using. On top of that, well, you are automatically coupling your code to something that might become like stale in the future because the uh, engineer supporting that or the community decides it's no longer useful and they just stop maintaining it. 
And on top of that, again, this is just an extra thing that you need to maintain. Um, if you spend time dealing with uh, Gradle conflict resolution, you'll know how painful this can be. Now, of course, there's always the situation where you don't want to build things from scratch when someone else already spent a lot of time doing it. And um, we're just asking you to think twice when it comes to adding that 3P library and stick to those libraries that have been almost like a standard for a while, uh, that have been well documented, that have a very powerful community, and uh, that have been built by companies and, and renowned communities that you trust. In the case of Android, for example, um, networking, something like Retrofit has been, it's almost like a standard right now. Um, it's been there for, since Android started. It's even in the Google documentation, and you don't want to implement your networking library. Also, it's not that hard to understand. Or things like security, where it's, uh, it's quite complicated, or very easy to make mistakes, uh, then it's better to um, use the third-party library. And even things like image fetching, for example, um, there's hundreds of libraries, but uh, Picasso, Fresco, um, they're created by super renowned communities, Meta, Square, Google. You know that those things are going to stay there for a while, and uh, they're super easy to, to understand and implement. It's just a one-liner. Now, let's move on with an example of uh, one of my screw-ups here, which is uh, Lombok. So in case you haven't heard about Lombok, it, is, um, it was a very popular login for, um, popular library for Java. It basically reduces the number, like the boilerplate that Java generates, which is one of the main pain points of Java. So in Android, it became super popular back then. Uh, you just add like um, annotations to the classes, and it just removes all the boilerplate. So if you want to have a getter, you just add add getter, and it creates this for you. Same things for setters. And data classes, for example, you just add an annotation, add data, and it will generate your two string, your hash code. So back then, this was five, six years ago. It seemed like a great idea to use it. Uh, it would make the development much easier. It would make us a lot more productive. And the team decided to include it. Now, we were super happy during three years until Google announced that Kotlin became the um, main language for Android. So, Kotlin already comes with all of the functions that Lombok had. And people decided to stop using Lombok because it was just easier to start using Kotlin. Now, this was fine for a while. We started migrating as well. But um, when we decided to update our Android Studio Glitter plugin, we noticed that uh, Lombok wasn't working. And we went to the Lombok team to ask them, can you fix it? They said, we haven't been supporting Lombok since two years because no one is using it anymore. Now, you can imagine what a problem was for us, because as soon as we compile our app with Lombok, and with this new version, basically everything was an error. Everything that was using Lombok was shown as an error. It was still compiling, we were able to release and everything, but it was a pain to, to work with, and we couldn't roll back our version of Android Studio. So, just an example of being more mindful of the libraries that you're using, and making sure that they're going to be supported for a long time. And another interesting example, it's with um, Log4j. In case you haven't heard of Log4j, it's a very popular login framework for Java. And um, about a year ago, uh, an Alibaba engineer found out that there was a big security vulnerability in, in this Log4j library. And um, of course, all alarms were raised. There are hundreds and thousands of teams using Log4j. It was like a COVID-19 for tech, you know? It was a big deal. And um, this was on a Friday, of course. The, the Log4j team immediately released a patch to fix it. But of course, all of the on-calls uh, within Amazon that were using uh, Log4j had to fix it on a Saturday really quickly. And the same thing happened throughout the world. So again, just think twice before adding the library and um, make sure it comes from a well-renowned community. Next one, AI, of course, we needed to include it, um, but we're not going to talk about AI exclusively, just uh, about the um, AI assistants. In case you haven't used them yet, Copilot is amazing. I think it costs like $10 per month. And uh, Amazon Code Whisperer, which we use as well, uh, they really help you increase your productivity. 
actually not so much the productivity. In my case, for example, it has been really useful for those tasks that are really annoying, like uh, code commenting uh, or very simple unit tests where you want to just write things quickly. Um, for me, it has been really useful. So in case you haven't tried them yet, strongly recommend it. Cool. Now, let's talk about dependency injection. Dependency injection is a huge matter, and it can definitely take its own 45-minute talk. So we're just going to try to skim through some really basic ideas and concepts around it, and I'm just going to leave you with some hot takes. So to begin with, when we're talking about dependency injection, we're not talking only about all these great shiny uh, tools like uh, and libraries like uh, Coin, like Dagger, so on, so on. Dependency injection is just a fancy way for parameter passing. So for example, when we're creating a, a class like the one above on the left, and we're passing those two parameters, those parameters are actually injected in the class. It doesn't need to have any fancy injection with Dagger or nothing else. It's, it is as simple as that. And the main thing that I want, you, I want to pass to you is that on quite a few occasions, when you're not dealing with massive code bases or <coughs> when your use case is not quite large, uh, instead <coughs> of actually using those uh, libraries that can have steep learning curve, that can increase your build time and your app size or your product size in general by quite a lot, you can just fall back to the manual way of doing dependency injection, and in quite plenty of cases, you can have it work as good. Now, uh, some ideas are that if you're actually struggling to unit test your application, that can be a hint that you should be leaning a little bit more in dependency injection, whether that means that if you're doing things manually, you should maybe try to set um, a new framework to help and speed up some of those dependency injections, or just start doing it uh, more by yourself. The hot take, as I told you, is that you don't need to actually use uh, all of these frameworks just by default. Just think about before adding them. They're, of course, super helpful. We are using them uh, on most of our projects, but it's not a one-way street. You don't necessarily have to use them every single time. And then I'm just going to leave you with a little tip. And <coughs> this has actually helped our team by quite a lot. And that is when we're dealing with a feature or a module or an app or whatever that uses dependency injection, uh, you can actually try to draw out uh, your dependencies on a piece of paper or any uh, design software. And it can actually help you visualize quite a lot what's happening in your application and what is being passed where in order to fasten up. Uh, in order to speed up uh, your development process. Cool. So we pass on to the code review stage. And um, as a general rule, we want to limit the number of changes in our code review, not only out of respect to our peers, but um, mainly um, we want to focus on work that can be independently reverted. Uh, we see many issues being found in production, and there's nothing worse than not being able to revert that because it already has dependencies on multiple features that cannot be reverted. So again, something that really helped us was to just make our code review super atomic and with features that we know that if hell breaks in production, we can easily revert that, continue with uh, the previous version, and fix that, um, and then put it back again. And another one that really helped us was uh, the branching strategy making sure that we are very clear on how to integrate new features to mainline, to develop, or whichever branching strategy that you decide to use, and especially on hot fixing, because you're under a lot of pressure. You need to hot fix that really quickly. Having that well documented has been really helpful for us and for new members of our team who maybe didn't know what was our initial release strategy. This is an interesting one. Um, that we tried uh, and had quite interesting results. So I read an article about um, a year ago where the author said that we should eliminate nitpicking like completely. In case you don't know what a nitpick is, is um, a comment on a code review that doesn't really address the core functionality 
of the code. It's maybe like a variable that could be named in a different way or extra spacing, extra structure, uh, using a scope function in Kotlin because uh, it looks cooler. So that's what a nitpick is. And basically the author suggested that we just eliminate nitpicking at all. Don't, don't even allow it on code reviews. So I brought it to the team, we decided to give it a try. And surprisingly, we realized that people started to shift their focus on code reviews from making the code look clean, nice, beautiful, to actually finding real bugs, to finding edge cases that whoever wrote that code had missed. And uh, we've been keeping it since then. Uh, we have prohibited nitpicks at all. And again, the number of comments are much lower, of course. But we've really been able to improve the signal-to-noise ratio in the, in the code reviews that uh, we have in our team. And uh, of course, you want to have clean code, beautiful. You want to make sure that variables are named correctly. But there are many different static code analyzers. For Kotlin, for example, you have uh, detect Kate Lint that even allow you to use custom rules. So you can define whatever you want, whatever rule that your team decides and that they don't want to see in code, you can define them there and it will fail even before going to a, a CR stage. Okay, uh, let's continue the development journey uh, for a feature or a new version. You've written your code, your code has been actually accepted by your peers and now it's time to run some CI CD. CI CD is continuous integration and continuous development. We don't have a lot to say on here, it's just that it is a great tool that we should definitely all be using that. It's not platform dependent. Uh, what we tend to do is that we definitely try to run every single unit test and make sure that every single unit test passes on every commit. And we're running, and that's happening automatically on every commit, and we're manually running <coughs> UI tests every time we complete either a feature or a bug. Uh, in order, again, to make sure that in terms of UI, so more high level, everything has been OK. Uh, again, there are many tools available, either for free or for a price. So just take your pick, choose what works best for you or your company, and try to integrate it into your own development. Uh, CICD has passed. Now it's time to do some manual testing. Manual testing is definitely something that, uh, uh, that needs to be done, especially when we're having consumer-facing uh, products. Uh, some ideas around it is that, or at least what we're trying to follow, is that every single piece of code uh, should definitely be tested before it gets merged into your develop or main or whatever your branching strategy is. And main and develop should always be uh, safe, should always be stable, and should always be ready for production. Why is that? The answer is pretty simple. Uh, when you have uh, any problems, any bugs that, found, uh, that find their ways into production, having a clean main and develop can make you easily revert or just push a new version uh, from where you are. And something else that is that you should be scheduling all of your releases beforehand. Again, with an example, let's say that I'm making, uh, that I'm building an application, and I know that I need to push a new version <coughs> by the end of the, <coughs> of the year. And I, <coughs> oh, <coughs> I'm sorry. And I also know that <coughs> in order to make a full regression, I need two full weeks. And those two full weeks will allow my QA testers to fully regress the application and the developers to actually get some time to fix any bugs that have just slipped around. So what that means is that I need to have a code cutoff two weeks before the end of the year, and nothing else will get inside this new release. Whatever happened up until that time will get in that release. Nothing else, though. And on those last two weeks, we're focusing on the regression, on testing, and on bug fixing. Again, this actually helps you quite a lot to make sure what's happening uh, when your product actually launches and reaches uh, to the hands of uh, consumers. And finally, let's close with some release techniques. Uh, we do have uh, quite some quite strong tools that we should be using. One of them is progressive rollouts, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about how important that is in a bit. But the idea is that we should definitely be creating <coughs> some rollout plans, and that means we don't just straight up deploy <coughs> everything into the 100% of your users. Start with small percentage, be on top of your user experience, be on top of your crasslytics using 
uh, various tools. There is Firebase. There are quite a lot of ways to actually monitor <coughs> your product. And, <coughs> and then uh, gradually increase the percentage of uh, your new release. <coughs> this actually helps, and uh, in, uh, with that, you make sure that if something actually hits production, it doesn't hit a huge amount of users, it hits a smaller amount, and it is more ma manageable. And this, is, this has been it. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry for that. Uh, <coughs> now we're actually going to tell you how we managed to screw up with, uh, within Amazon and some issues that we actually managed to cause while we were working there. So the first two are mine. Uh, the initial one is how we actually managed to have a user sign-out uh, nightmare scenario. And this was when I was working in Fire TV as well. And I was in charge of uh, two television applications that shared the same credential uh, authentication system. So what I was tasked to do is to create a single, uh, to merge those two authentication systems into one. So when the user is signed in, signs into one application, they're automatically signed into the other application. And when they sign out of one, they're automatically signed out of the other. I was tasked about the work. I did, all, I did everything. The work got QA tested. Everything seemed fine. And then was just pushed into production. And then within a few hours uh, of our day, and I think it was like a Wednesday or, thir or um, a Thursday or Friday or something like that, we started getting quite a lot of uh, really angry emails from customers that they were signed out. Of course, we knew that something went wrong. And within a few minutes of uh, doing research, uh, me and my team, we figured out that we actually missed quite a huge use case. And we missed the use case of the users actually updating from an older version of the application. And we just developed on the uh, use case of users just installing the app brand new. So, of course, we fixed it quite fast. The fix was not the issue. It was a really quick one. And we managed to release uh, a new version in order to contain uh, the problem uh, as much as possible. But, of course, we didn't use any progressive rollouts. So, within a couple of hours, immediately, the problem was in a couple of million uh, televisions across the UK. And from those million users, we managed to get a couple of hundred. Uh, angry emails, and if we just use progressive rollouts and then just uh, cut it down to like one or two percent, instead of a few million, we would get a few thousand uh, televisions that have this issue, and maybe one or two emails, uh, angry emails for the matter. So this is how progressive rollout would actually help us quite a lot in here uh, to prevent something like that. This is actually how my work managed to get into the British newspapers. So I'm a little bit proud of that. Uh, next one is actually how I managed to delay the launch of a new Amazon device, a new Amazon television, <coughs> by six days, uh, when I mistakenly I mistook uh, the letter zero for uh, the letter uh, the digit zero for the letter O. Uh, a little bit backstory on that: when Amazon actually wants to launch a new device, a new television, they need to certify it on um, some aspects. And I was running the one of the certifications. And when you're running the certifications, you need to run them against some device ID, some device type. And that device type is a really long um, alpha arithmetic string. So we got this uh, long string in a form of a picture. That was a really big, huge red flag. So I didn't manage to actually uh, get it in the form of string. But what I did, silly me, was I just took out my phone open my camera and use this image-to-text recognition software. And I just took whatever that gave me and started running certifications. And of course, nothing was passing because I was running them against the wrong ID, the wrong uh, alpha arithmetic. And that took us quite a long to figure out <coughs> what was the issue. It took us six days. <coughs> and when we did, of course, we quickly fixed it and we managed to move along. And basically, the takeaway from this one is that we actually had to refine quite a lot of our communication uh, processes in order to pretty much mitigate uh, those mis, uh, miscommunication uh, happen, uh, happenings in the future. Time's up. Should we go to the questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, all right. Uh, do you want to go really quick about this one and then do one or two questions? S super quick. Um, I was implement had to implement um, 
server-side authentication in our app with a tool called AWS Cognito. It turns out that it was really complicated to do it, and I found out that there was a, a library provided by Amazon called Amplify, which had everything I needed. So I decided to integrate it, and it turns out it was even more complicated because of dependency conflicts and so on. So I said, I'll just take a look at the code uh, that makes this um, server-side authentication part. It turns out that it was not that complicated. It was a single class with 300 lines. So I said, I'll just copy it. And uh, in fact, it was in Java. I'll make it in Kotlin. And uh, it worked. So I thought that's great. It's working in production. Fast forward four months. Turns out that the implementation that I had copied was, uh, had, a, had a bug. And of course, the team fixed it. And I never noticed. So basically, from one day to the other, all of our users were signed out of our application. And we had to roll back, ended up integrating with Amplify in the end. The takeaway here is that if you're not an absolute expert in terms of security, just lean on the work that other people have done. And that has, a, again, a very well-maintained community. And that cool. has been it. So thank you very much for listening to us. And yeah, we're open to any questions, maybe a few.